please. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. Here is Pastor Arnold Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get back into our Father's words, the teachings of Christ. He was the way, and when he preached, what was it that he preached? He preached the kingdom, the gospel, and the kingdom of God. That is to say, concerning the kingdom of God. And um, he taught in, in the churches. He taught at the gatherings. Uh, he healed the sick. His ministry had begun, in other words. And his fame, because of the healing primarily, was gathering great crowds. So he took his people, his disciples, up onto a, a, um, a mountain. And then he's teaching them there. You might say these are the basics that he would teach them in their going out and in how you would uh, propagate, how you would pass on the Word of God. And, you know, the true in-depth meanings never change. Every generation or so, you'll have a bunch of misfits that will come along and feel, we've found a new way to teach the gospel by force or by this or by that. And they show their ignorance in bringing forth the simple message, the discipline, and the straightforwardness that is in the Word. And he told them, as we closed in the last lecture, you are the salt of the earth, so, and if you lose your savor, or that's to say your saltiness, you're not fit for anything. So you're supposed to be a little bit salty, or wherever you go, it should be a little different when you leave, simply by the presence of the Holy Spirit within you and the example that you are setting if, if you carry this message, if you follow in His footsteps rather than to try, trying to forge your own way. It's so simple, but so difficult for some to learn. They feel, I guess, they're better than Christ, or they know the better way, or they know a shortcut. Do it his way. You'll always win. Okay, with that having been said, a word of wisdom from our Father. Let's pick it up in the 14th verse as he continues to teach the disciples, not the multitude. Let's, and we ask that word of wisdom from our Father. And verse 14 of Matthew 5 reads, Ye are the light, or the phos in the Greek, of the world. You're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. In other words, why would you be the light of the world? We're not a light within ourselves. It's when you follow the light, that is to say, Yeshua Messiah, then that light reflects even from the very beam of your eye, mirrors your soul, even if you would. And you can't set, what he's saying is, if you let that light shine, in truth, in honesty, I mean, now, if someone start, would start to think that they were something special because of this, it would show you that rather than light, they're darkness. Absolutely, total darkness, ego trip buzzards that will never amount to anything. Because it is the light of Christ within you when you are doing the work of Christ important that you know that. Not the work of some association. Not the work of some barnstormers. But the work of Jesus Christ. Uh, it's the only way. That cannot be hidden. No one can take it away from you when you let Christ shine through you. All right, verse 15. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. And that's, that's a very simple 
analogy. In other words, when you take within yourself the light, and Christ was that light, then you don't hide it under a bushel. You let it shine. You become that candlestick, not the light, but the holder of the light, and people can tell. They know when an humble, honest Christian is in their midst because of the way they do and the common sense that they have disciplined themselves in and operate on that frequency. And it transmits to anyone around the way, the truth. And it does make a difference. Just a salt added to, a, to, a, to water that has no flavor. It changes it. So to people that follow Christ, they change things. Verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good faith. Oh, I'm sorry. It doesn't say faith, does it? That they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. It is your works and that light that glorify our Father. Faith, your faith, does it glorify him? Well, only that you accept him and he knows. But it is your faith is a free gift to you. That is to say, if you believe, then you have faith in him. But faith within itself is a beautiful thing, and I'm not taking away from it. But faith without works is dead. Your light isn't shining. You got, you're saving the fuel. You didn't got your damper turned down. And you're a nobody. That's what he's telling you. Don't ever forget that. Quite frankly, the only thing that you can take with you when you leave this body, uh, when you so-called go to heaven, is your works. And that's documented in the 14th chapter of the great book of Revelation. Now, what is it? that they may see, what is it they're going to see about you? Your works. You can tell by the actions of a person if they're truly a Christian. You can tell by the actions of a person if they truly have faith because nobody works for something they do not have faith in. Verse 17, listen carefully. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And so it is. Many people teach that the law is done away with. That means the law that is written, thou shalt do no murder, it's done away with. And they show their ignorance concerning God's word. Biblically illiterate. He came not and he said, don't you ever think for a moment that I've destroyed the law, but to fulfill. Have you not noted that I have carefully gone back, every time it is stated, it is written, we've gone back to the law, the Torah, which is, that's what the Old Testament is. And it's being fulfilled here. But never forget that the the major part of Ezekiel chapter 40 to the end is yet to happen in the millennium. It hasn't happened yet. It hasn't come to pass. It must be fulfilled and it shall be fulfilled. Verse 18. For verily I say unto you, till heaven, he's going to tell you when, till heaven and earth pass, one jot the word jot here in the Greek is iota. In the Hebrew, it is the Hebrew letter Y, which is yod. That's, that's, it would look like an English comma, the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Now, the word tittle is what? Uh, there are different opinions among scholars in as much as the word tittle in the manuscripts is an Aramaic word. Uh, some like to translate it that 
it is a dot that is an ornamental dot, much like a tine, if you're familiar with manuscripts, like there might be three, four, or five tine put upon, let's say, a yod, or a noon, or mem, or whatever the case might be, to give some arrangement or priority or strength to it, and unfortunately, even the Maseru itself has not maintained the value of time. What are you saying? I don't even change the smallest little dot in the law. I don't even change the smallest little indicator. Um, a small dot makes an E either pronounced E, drawn out, long, or uh, the short E. It makes the, a difference in the, the value of A, the vowels, in other words. Okay. I think he is stressing there to the very smallest of um, the very so uh, s smallest notes of communication. He didn't change even the sound of a letter. All right, verse 19. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and here he hangs to the least as far as the smallest and shall teach men, now listen to me, did you hear that? And shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever, whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. What is he saying here? He's preparing, these are disciples, which means they're disciplining themselves in the Word of God, for what purpose to teach it? Or to go forth and expound upon it, maybe just planting seeds in some cases. But he said, men that go out and change the actual meaning of things, or change the Word, or misteach the Word. In other words, we're talking about preachers. A preacher that leads his entire flock through the rapture doctrine to worship the false Messiah, which definitely comes first, will be the least in the kingdom of heaven. So you want to be careful what you teach. And this even goes to the layperson. You better know what you teach. But if you study God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, whereby you have a working knowledge and you convey that, you let your light broadcast that to the very people in your presence, then that one is the greatest in the kingdom, a champion for God that listens to the teachings of Yeshua, whereby nothing is changed. Never be one of these people that adds to the word of God to formulate their method of, of uh, worship. Or you're wasting your time. You're going to be the least in the kingdom. You're blowing it. Absolutely blowing it. When, anytime you give men more credit for knowledge than Christ himself, you've had it, friend. You're all through. You're washed up. You don't amount to anything. Least in the kingdom of heaven. The widow's might will make you look like a mite as far as size or importance is concerned. Let your works be show forth as that light on the candlestick, and let those works be what Christ has taught you to do in serving Him. Now, I don't want to put anyone on a guilt trip. Uh, supporting uh, a part of a family, that is to say, a ministry, that's good work. It's good works. And and the entire family shares equally. But make sure that you don't support something that teaches falsehood. Or likewise, you will be the smallest in the kingdom. If you think you are a teacher, then you'd better know what you're teaching, and it'd better be God's word you're teaching rather than something you ate a sour pickle and had a bad dream in the night. That'll get you nowhere. Verse 20, all right? Listen carefully, same subject. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, 
ye shall in no case, none whatsoever, no case, enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, remember how we started this chapter in the last lecture with the eight Beatitudes. And I told you that in Appendix 126 in your companion Bible, you had a perfect lineup of the first Beatitude was the kingdom of God is open to those that will participate. The first woe given in Matthew chapter 23, and we'll be there in a few lectures, is that the scribes and the Pharisees sit in the seat of Moses. What is Moses? The lawgiver. And the, what they do with the first woe is they close the kingdom of God where no one can go in. If you listen to them, be very careful in this generation, my friend. For many that think they're doing God a service are listening to too many traditions and slogans created by man that will, and you may think it's so patriotic that it's really the thing to do. And you're searing a hot iron and branding your way straight into hell because you've left the path of Christ, his way, and gone the way of men, which Satan loves it. He'll always have somebody present among people like that. Egging them on. And they're too stupid to know the difference. It happens, my friend. Be righteous. Well, how do I be righteous? Christ was righteous. He was the only perfect. Copy him. And and at least give him the credit for knowing how things should be done, or you shouldn't call yourself Christian. You should get out. If you think you know more than Jesus Christ, you should get out. Because he tells us the perfect way and the way we will have the victory, the way we will put down any opposition that comes against us, it will be crushed but it will be done his way. Beware the righteousness of organizations and follow the righteousness of God himself, your father. All right? Now, still the law. Remember, Moses was the lawgiver. The scribes were hypocrites, and a hypocrite in the Greek, it means a play actor, somebody playing a part. And I guarantee you, there will be many play the part. All right, verse 21. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time. You, you've read it back there in the law. Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. Now, he's handling the law here, but you see... When you have translators, this is why that you must even check out as the dear old boys that translated the King James, transliterated in many cases, wrote you a letter in the original Bible. That's why I keep a, a copy available for you, not as a study Bible, but as a Bible primarily where you can read the letter that the translators wrote to you, the reader, if you're a reader of the King James. And they warn of such errors as this right here, that you should check them out. And you've got a lot of Bible thumpers every time someone is executed rightfully for murder or whatever the case is in this nation out there thumping their Bible in ignorance. Now, the commandment is not thou shalt not kill it is thou shalt do no murder that means in a criminal sense that means to lie and wait to premeditate to take a life then you're going to be judged for it that's what he says now now let's call up the greek word that is used here from the manuscripts and it is phanyo and it's to be a murderer, but I want you to note that the prime is from 5406. Let's have it. In other words, this is your meaning of the word kill, as it's supposed to be translated here. And phanyos uh, is um, 
a murderer always of criminal or at least intentional homicide. And that's, that's what is necessary. In other words, thou shalt do no murder. And if you do murder, well, let's read the verse again and let's, let's read it like it is, all right? I'll just read it to you. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit a criminal homicide. And whosoever shall commit a criminal homicide shall be in danger of the judgment. That's to say God's judgment. In other words, I didn't change that law. It is important that you know the difference between ordinances, statutes, rituals, uh, and law. There is a difference. As an example, many of the blood sacrifices, ordinances, and rituals are done away with for one and all times, and, and that is ap aptly recorded in Hebrews chapter 10. So you have to use a little intelligence. Law is very difficult to teach to a whole because law, God's law, that is to say, it is according to every situation as to the parties involved that bring to pass the application of God's law. And if you teach a law, then you must at the same time associate the crime with the people who committed it as to uh, their guilt, the sentence, and so forth. And there are no maybes or what. If you're guilty, you're dead. That's the penalty for murder. And then why? Because then you're there with the person you took their life and God wants to talk with you. He wants to judge you. Then you can see whether or not the person that's th that you took their life is waiting there to forgive you. Will they? Well, they may not. In other words, you're in danger of judgment. You're in danger at judgment. Why? You very likely are going to hell. You want to think twice. This is one of the laws that he, and he even makes it more severe than that. You spill their blood, but listen to what he says now as we continue in verse 22. But I say unto you, I'm going to add this to it, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause. Now that doesn't mean who's angry at their brother with a cause. Let me read it again in case you misunderstood. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Rekha, shall be in danger of the council, that's to say the Sanhedrin or local law. But whosoever shall say, Thou who, shall be in the danger of hellfire. Now again, this will not carry in the English, I'm sorry. First, in this chapter, as we cover it, you're going to come across the term brother and neighbor. And if you don't know the value of those words, you're not going to understand what Christ is teaching. A brother, uh, the very Greek word means of the womb, meaning of the same womb. It's blood relative, of the same kind. Whereas you're going to hear the term neighbor, and a neighbor is a Gentile or a person of some other race or family that is a proselyte, or that is to say, is converted into Christianity or Israel. Right? When, you, when you believe upon Christ, then, and you are aside from these men chosen from the house of Israel, then uh, they are a neighbor. And it's important, and it's real easy for you to prove me wrong if you think I am. Take your Strong's Concordance and check it out but be intelligent enough to at least take it to the prime, all right? So if your blood brother or one of your kind, if you're angry at them without cause, God holds that against you. 
I suppose what you really need to know is if you won't forgive him and it's your fault and if, you, if you're angry without cause, you, you, um, you're in the wrong, all right? There's no way you can be angry without cause without being in the wrong. That's what he's saying. So you need to do a little repentance. Now, let's go to, to these terms, reka and fool, because the English word does not carry them through. If you, reka is a kind of a minor thing, like you might say in English, oh, you, like that, okay? Just a little light oh, of, of frustration, perhaps. Oh, you. But the word fool here, our English word fool won't even scratch the surface. For in the manuscripts, the Greek moros, or in the Hebrew, nebal. In other words, don't, what, what does, what does moros uh, mean? Our word moron kind of comes from this, um, but it's, it's more severe than that. And it would do you well to check it out. Because moros means uh, someone that is absolutely void of any spiritual or religious inclination or even desire to learn of God. <clears throat> In other words, when you call someone moros, you're already judging that they're going to hell. That's the point. And what he's saying is, is you're playing God when you call someone moros. And he doesn't like it. He doesn't like it at all. Uh, you're calling a person void of all scriptural or divine knowledge. Uh, a moron deluxe, all right? But what's worse is they don't want to know. And they would perhaps rather follow Satan than God. So. Understand, if someone called someone a fool, well, I'm not I'm certainly not recommending it, but our word fool in the English is a completely different word than telling someone they are totally void of any scriptural or spiritual knowledge to follow God and they're going straight to hell. You're judging them instead of letting God do the judging. Hey, your father doesn't like that. Verse 23, therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, if you're going to be spiritual yourself and leave a, a, a gift at the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, in other words, you wronged him and your brother's got a right to have a little something against you, 24, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go to and go thy way first be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift in other words use common sense use common sense in all things if if you've done something to your brother offended him and have not gone to him and say please forgive me uh, i why i did it perhaps you don't know, then say so, be honest, and ask his forgiveness. And what, what Christ is telling you, it won't do you any good to offer a gift if you can't forgive your brother, because God's not going to forgive you, meaning you can give the gift, but God's not going to give you any blessings. Now, if a brother has offended you for no cause, then you, as one of God's elect, are supposed to understand many times Satan uses our brother, and remember the definition of brother, of the womb, then you can be bigger because you understand how Satan might even use him to get to you. And you can forgive. You don't have to, um, if he has not apologized or repented to you. I'm saying you can understand. That's common sense. Never fail to use common sense. God understands that because that's the way he created us. Very common 
which is very natural, and it just so happens that he is even supernatural, which means more natural. So that's why he understands using good common sense. Okay, verse 25. Agree with thine adversary quickly. Now there's a qualification. This doesn't mean you're supposed to be a yes man and a rubber stamp to everything that comes along. Whilst, this is the condition, whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verse 26, Verily I say unto thee, Thou shalt by no means come out thence, till thou hast paid the uttermost farthlin. We got a lot of people that they, when you're in, while you're in the way. What, what is the duty of one of God's election? It's a prime purpose in that generation of the fig tree is to witness against Satan as it is written in Mark 13 or as we'll find in Matthew 24. But a lot of these people just have to go out and mix it up with the government. They can't help it. While you're in the way, say, hey, give me five men and pass on. You didn't say anything. Oh, no, but I want to get in there and tell them what I think. I want to, I want to form an association and we're going to do something about this. Oh, you are. Do you want me to read it to you again? If you don't know how to say high five or, oh, hey, well, how about you? To someone like that, verily I say unto thee, Thou shalt by no means come out thence. You're going to be locked up till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing, the last penny, maybe even past the time of witness. That's the purpose. Get involved with traditions and ways of men when the smooth road whereby it makes you and causes you to be a can-do type person by listening to the Word, by studying the Word, and most of all, disciplining yourself in the Word, and doing the work of the Word. Not a bunch, not what some bunch of nuts might say. Because I guarantee you, you'll get in trouble. The adversary is one of Satan's names, and he's behind it. He just loves to trip folks up that are not too bright up here. That like to listen to men. Let me clue you in on a secret association. Oh, yes. There's just one problem. You got one of them sitting there in on the secret, too. And you know what? You're not bright enough to see it. And you know who's going to turn you in? In the way? Him. Your good buddy, buddy. I always call them Yankee Doodle Dandies. Boy, they got the American flag sewed on them and they're talking the loudest and they're making the most slogans, we shall overcome, you know? And they're spotters placed there to destroy the weak-minded that can be with illusion taken by the wiles of the adversary the easy, cheap way. God's election are priests, and they fight the priestly battle, not snake jargon or lotion. Snake lotion is something a medicine man used to sell, and there was always somebody that would buy it. Really sharp, all right? Think about it. Discipline yourself in the Word and focus on your Father. The law is very much in effect with the exception of the ordinances and rituals, some of them Christ himself fulfilled. But the law still remains. It's our school teacher. And anytime you break one, you're in trouble. That's what Christ is telling you, giving you some very good advice. All right, bless your hearts. We'll pick this up in the next lecture. Listen a moment.